Hey everybody, you're listening to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today on the show, we have a customer-focused CEO. He is Sean Nelson, CEO and founder of LoveSack. The company was started in 1998. 25 years later, LoveSack is a publicly traded high-end furniture retailer with 160 showrooms across America. We're talking about Sean's customer experience mindset, how he made the company incredibly successful by differentiating on not just innovation, but customer experience. We're talking about some of the things you guys love to hear about on this show, like customer experience metrics, like what's going on with e-commerce innovation, D to C. And we're talking about the future of all of these things. Please enjoy our guest, Sean Nelson. This week's episode is sponsored by Calendly. Customer success teams strive to provide superior service, but customer expectations are continuously increasing. It's a challenge to efficiently schedule handoffs, onboarding calls, training sessions, renewal conversations, and more. That's why modern customer service teams use Calendly to interact with customers at key milestones. Instead of scheduling delays that create a disjointed experience, Calendly makes it easy for your team to focus on building partnerships and maintaining engagement through renewal time. That's why CI Asante Wealth saw a 323% ROI using Calendly. See how Calendly can help your team drive adoption and increase retention and growth at Calendly.com slash modern customer. Sean, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Are you calling in from Utah today? No, so I'm actually living in San Diego right now um, while we remodel our home in Utah, which is, I guess, my home base and where we have a Lovesack uh, product development office and kind of going back and forth a little bit, but um, spending one year on the West Coast. Oh my goodness. So you are 90 minutes to two hours from me in LA, depending on the day. Um, just curious, why did you choose San Diego, except that it's beautiful? <laughs> except for that uh great question except for that um it listen it i feel like i stole it it is a beautiful place to be and we're trying to surf every day and so we have four kids and they've my wife and kids have put up with me building this company our whole existence yeah and it's it's just kind of a cool opportunity to do something differently you know from the grind and covid kind of sent us all working remotely and we've been totally remote since the beginning of COVID. We made that decision Uh huh. and it's turned out to be a fantastic uh, thing for our company and for me personally as well. And just kind of leaning into that. Isn't that amazing that you probably never thought that you would just be able to work from anywhere which, like none of us could have imagined. And now so many of us, so many of us, our lives are so different and it's kind of nice. No one wants to go back yeah. to the way things were. <laughs> yeah, it won't happen because, you know, companies like mine are recruiting people from the best companies on the planet now in any geography. And uh, that was not necessarily the case before COVID where we kind of had to recruit from the tri-state area of, of you know, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. We have a home base in Stamford, Connecticut. That's where our HQ1 is. And so now your talent pool is just greatly increased. And the, obviously people have that option and so even these mega corporations unless they unless it's a job that must be in person like our product development office actually in utah that's a role that needs to be in person because they're dealing with samples and they're creating things but aside from roles like that or you know customer facing roles um remote will be the answer for corporate america going forward so today we're talking about customer experience, as we always do on The Modern Customer. We're talking about D to C. We're talking about Love Sack and your transformation innovation story. Let's take it back to that first beanbag where I read you were just kind of having fun. Tell our audience how you came up with the idea for Love Sack. Yeah, I mean, the short version is I'm 18 years old, sitting on my parents' couch, watching TV, and just out of high school. And... Uh, that summer before college. And I thought it'd be funny 
popped into my mind. I thought it'd be funny to make a beanbag like this big, like me to the TV, the whole floor. Yeah. yeah. And I'm kind of uh, impulsive, got off the couch, drove down to the fabric store, bought some fabric, brought it home, cut it up. Um, I couldn't realize my home ec skills from the seventh grade were limited. So my sewing stopped when the machine jammed, but my my uh, girlfriend's mom finished sewing it for me, put a zipper in it. It took me three weeks to stuff it. Couldn't find enough beanbag beads. So cut up my parents' camping mattresses, you know, like yellow foam with a bungee oh, cord around it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and people loved it. Everywhere we took it, you know, we'd take it camping, take it to the drive-in movies, take it, you know, in the back of a truck. And, and everywhere we took it, everyone loves it, wants one. And I mean, that's, of course, the first sign, right? Like if you actually have people asking for what you have, there's there's a there there, but it would be three years. And uh, I went away on a mission. I, I did a year of school, went away on a mission, came back from my missionary trip to uh, 21 years old. And my neighbor finally having seen me take this thing out of the garage and use it again, kept asking me to make them one and finally responded, made one for them and needed a name that was like love, peace, hate, war, hippie, beanbag, love, bag, love, sack. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the company was born in 1998 and it was a side hustle through college. But, you know, one customer led to the next customer, led to the next, just one of those things. And I think that was the, I think that there's something really elegant. To, at the time, I was just, I was just kind of living it. You know, I was, I was like, I thought it was this funny thing to do. It's cool to have a business in college. It made all my business courses feel so relatable. Um, but really I didn't make any money. I was waiting tables, you know, I was paying my way through school, working those kind of jobs. This just sucked my money. You know, I had to fix the equipment, fix the van, pay for Mark, you know, pay for a, a trade show here or like a boat show, home show, car show, 10 by 10 booth. It was that kind of side hustle. Yeah. But, um, but you know, people liked it. And I think like there was nothing forced about it. You know, it was like, yeah, I had to pay to show up at some of those events, but every event we showed up at, we made sales and people would tell their friends and they'd buy it. And I think that there was something really telling about that. Like if you have something really good, right. people want it Right. when they're presented with it. And I think sometimes in this day and age of marketing, we, we want to shove things down people's throats because we thought of it. Right. So we want to sell it. But I think you really want to look for that spark, you know, like do people love what you have out of the gate? And if not, how, how could you get it there? Yeah, I find the furniture industry to be really interesting. We moved into, we moved during COVID like so many others and we had to furnish a big house and that's a good problem to have. However, it's not as simple as you'd think. The customer experience can be really bad when you order a couch and it's damaged or it's not comfortable. And it is tough to, to imagine what is this couch going to look like in my house? So just curious what you think makes your D2C brand different or just explain the model to our audience and what makes it special. Yeah. I mean, I think it's worth noting the funny thing about D2C for Lovesack is that as large D2C brands go, we are one of the few that have actually made any money. Yeah. And I don't think that most people even realize that it's happening in real time. You know, you have all these names we could rattle off of, of companies that have gone public through the DTC realm or even become quite well known, but have never made any money. And, and let's see, Love, Lovesack made a pivot to the DTC world in 2015, uh -huh. observing, you know, the Caspers yes. and even Tesla, you know, using showrooms to, you know, sell their cars, not, you know, cars. And we thought, well, what, what would it look like for us? Because we had retail stores. We were like a little tiny West End. We were selling rugs, bowls, lamps, baskets, decorative accessories, all that stuff. And, and observing that movement, we purged all that stuff, converted our stores to showrooms, no inventory, and became a true 100% DTC brand. We don't have any wholesale, unlike a lot of DTC brands, actually, that pad their business with a lot of wholesale sales, whether apparel right. or mattress, take your pick. And so even though we came up backwards, you know, we weren't like a DNV, you know, digitally native brand that, that was purely online that then maybe opened a showroom or two. We actually had stores, converted them to showrooms and focused our business online. We were already online, but, you know, true DTC execution. And now, you know, well north of half a billion in sales, you know, we're going to go past 600 this year and beyond. 
and crazy growth and doing it profitably. And I'm really proud of that because, you know, again, I think it speaks to there's actually something behind our products. It's not just a marketing game. It's not just a conversion game. It's not just a, you know, what can I pay for a customer and and what can I take from them? It's like you have to have, to your point a second ago, a better experience, a better product. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we do. So you ha- you saw the writing on the wall in 2015. You went D2C before so many others did. But I understand it wasn't all roses and butterflies and you came out of bankruptcy or you avoided bankruptcy. What happened and how did you fix it? Yeah, so so that transition was all the way back in 2006. So the funny thing about LoveSack is that we're super old. right? <laughs> I started the company in 98, um, raised venture capital in 2005, five six, and their first move was like, hey – Let's get out of, you know, you, you've been a bunch of 20 year olds opening these beanbag stores, essentially these giant love sack stores, because that's what we did uh, after college. We opened our own stores and some of them were great. Some were terrible. We franchised even. Let's reorganize the company in 2006, go through the very painful, embarrassing, you know, humiliating process of that, close more than half of them down, reemerge with only a dozen and build it clean. And we did that for the next decade as we invented sectionals. So that's our modular couches that we sell today that to your point, Blake, it would have been, um, three days for you to get your couch from us typically, you know, so, and it would have hopefully shown up flawlessly. So, and that was all the way through the pandemic. We've never been out of stock over stock because again, the, the, if you understand how sectionals work, you buy a bunch of seats, you buy a bunch of sides, you build 10,000 different couches, you add any cover you want. Um, this this designed for life approach to product design that emerged from the advent of sectionals has really become our mantra and has really given us a unique value proposition. But the, you know, it's a whole decade of trying to figure out what to do with these modular couches we had invented. We were just trying to put a couch in a box back then. This is all the way 2006, mm-hmm. coming out of that reorganization, and we invented sectionals. But then you know we had to figure out how to become a furniture company. We spent a whole decade in furniture land, kind of breaking even pretending we were, you know, a little pottery barn or West Elm hiring from those organizations even to be like that. Cause that's, that was the playbook. When we finally made that pivot to direct consumer in 2015, it really took off. And so being really flexible with the business model and, and kind of really trying to look ahead and see, you know, making huge business pivots has been what's led us to this success that we finally gotten to at LoveSack. In my opinion, it seems like we are on the brink of real change in your industry. I just can't believe that some of these mainstream brands are still treating customers the way they do. They make it really hard to return something. They charge customers to send something back. Often the products are damaged. You can't get a product. So I'm curious what advice you have for the whole e-commerce world that are clearly struggling with so many aspects of just providing a seamless zero friction customer experience. Yeah. Well, you know, in the product world, like in actual physical things, e-commerce is not created equally. Right. And what I mean by that is, yeah, we can all reach customers equally. In fact, some industries are maybe more rife for disruption than others because they're, they've been slow to the uptake or they're a little more traditional or, or whatever. And maybe you could say furniture is one of those. But on the other hand, furniture is big. And you're dealing with big objects and heavy objects often. And there's lots of barriers. You know, there's other, there's even regu- regulatory barriers. Like in the mattress world, as we all know, right? Like returns yeah. are problematic, not only because they're big and heavy, but also because you can't just sell a used mattress to someone, right? So you, everyone has these 30, 60 day, 90 day, you know, whatever, 10 year guarantees. And people do make returns and then you have that issue to wrangle with. And so I think that there are just actual physical barriers to different categories that need to be taken into account when you choose to get into these categories and compete. And so I think that a lot of these furniture brands, to your point, whether we're talking about traditional ones or even some, or even some, you know, DTC brands that are out there are challenged number one, by those real issues. And number two, uh, there is a certain amount of laziness that comes in an industry that has been allowed to be lazy. And and I don't mean that like in a critical way. What I mean is like, for instance, customers are, are sort of used to waiting for furniture. You know, like we thought 
being able to ship to you in, in like a day or two days would be really amazing because that's what Amazon does. And by the way, if any furniture could do it, ours could, because the way that it comes packed down and ships to you, mm -hmm. FedEx, we could get to that. Yeah. But as we did our own research, we discovered that actually customers in this category don't care. Already a week is fast, like right. crazy fast. A few two days, days is crazy is fast. Kind of shocking. <laughs> Well, not only that, but like if it sh frankly, if you ordered it on Monday and it showed up on Wednesday, that may be a pain, big pain in the butt because you can't deal with it till Saturday, like right. in your life, like you don't have time to deal with your couch. Yeah. So in other words, like it didn't, what mattered to them is not speed. What matters to them is being able to time it and to choose their date and stuff like that. So those are the strategies we're pursuing. But my point is these strategies are not always obvious on their face. It's easy for us to look at like Amazon and say like, I'm going to be just like that someday, you know, cause they're awesome. Well, you know, each category is different. And, and that was kind of like a, an eye opener to us that, that in this category, the, what the customer needed was not, a, you know, a dozen boxes piled up to the, their, their roof line stacked on their porch on a Wednesday morning necessarily while they were at work or something, mm -hmm. no matter how fast it was. And, and, and so I just think like, it's very important for, uh, brand builders to make sure that they really understand where the customer meets the expectations of that particular category. And it's not always yeah. obvious. Sean, that's so perceptive. Like maybe a customer isn't ready because I can totally relate to that. Maybe when your customer orders the sectional, they actually have to get rid of something to have room for it in their house. Or like you said, they're working. But the question is, how do you know what's happening with your customer? How do you get that feedback? Do mm -hmm. you talk to customers personally? Of course. So, I mean, the team, you know, and LoveSack is developed into a, you know, a fairly large organization now. We probably have the best selling couch in America, like by the numbers, like in over half a billion in sales in just couches, pretty much like it's in, in one line of couches, you know, it's a, it's a re and so we're in, and so these are, this is very high volume is my point. So we have really robust uh, marketing teams, really robust customer love teams, we call them, you know, and they're, we're talking to customers every day. And we, we learn a lot from that post-purchase research, tracking our post-purchase customer satisfaction, driving it up, even as our volumes are climbing. That's, that's the challenge, right? Like, can you chase crazy volume and drive that customer satisfaction up by developing better programs, by listening, by, by developing the programs to suit these customers? So we have very institutionalized mechanisms for garnering feedback, of course, online, you know, the typical, um, give us, you know, tell us what you think, text, all the, all those ways. But to be honest with you, another, another and, and by the way, we invest a lot into research. Like so we spend a lot of time and effort sitting down with customers, both for quantitative and for, you know, these individual focus group kind of research sessions. But beyond all of that, one of the, one a very useful thing to me is frankly I lead a very open public life on Instagram, mm -hmm. and and Love Sack is really active on these channels, social media channels, and and on YouTube and whatnot. And I hear from customers every day, and they DM me or they ah. or they complain to me, mm -hmm. and and even it, with a brand that's fairly large, being plugged in like that and seeing you know, like what they got, what their problem is. Like, it's very, very useful um, on an individual level. And, and, you know, and look, there will always be problems and, you know, there will always be damages that occur in shipping and things like that happen. But um, I think staying plugged in, especially obviously at my level, at the CEO level, but but also the teams, you know, being plugged in, being in touch. There's, there's so much available now, you know, because it's all out there. People are putting it out there. Do you think, since you have been both a small company and a large company, do you think it's much harder to be customer centric when you're a large company? Uh, in some ways, yes. In other ways, no. And in, 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 in when I say no, it's because you have the resource to invest in all of these sort of things that I'm alluding to, right? Like we, we never could afford proper research when we were smaller. We never, it was really just like operating on instinct and one by one. But on the other hand, you know, for those years, for instance, when I was in college as a side hustle, I knew every person. I, I mean, I was personally cutting out their sack on my parents' floor and then shipping, you know, shipping their orders out and and whatnot. And that obviously persisted for a long time. And even, even when we had our own stores, um, I was working in those stores, you know, in the beginning. And so 
in, in many ways, it's easier. In some ways, it can be harder, though, because you know them personally. You know, it, it can be it can create for some really unnatural sort of customer interact. It's awesome on the one hand because, you you know, you get to interact with them, but it can also customers can take advantage of that, too. Mm -hmm. You know, and there will always, and it's tricky because there will always be people who really essentially want something for nothing. And I'm not trying to be critical of people, but it's out there. And, and when you can't hide behind policy or behind, you know, cause, cause you still are running a business and it needs to make money. And sometimes customers can be completely unreasonable, you mm -hmm. know, like there also is like a reasonableness that I think we expect as human beings you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, and, I mean, you're, and you're a you, target. When you're a big company, customers assume you have tons of money. And if the littlest thing is off, they might see it as an opportunity to take advantage. That's right. And it's tricky because you you certainly don't want to disparage your customers or be ungrateful. At the same time, you, have, you, you are running a business that's expected to generate returns, right? And so I think it's a mixed bag. But, but I think in order, I will say this. Customer centricity, even as you said it, is one of our few stated values. And by values, what I mean is we have these different buckets. We call it aspirational values. In other words, we are still trying to be mm -hmm. more customer centric. We have not achieved it. We don't state it as a core value or even table stakes. We are chasing it as an organization and we still have a ways to go. And so it remains in that um bucket of aspirational values that we state for ourselves and we speak to and we train to and we're still trying. Well, Sean, I'm so glad you brought up returns because I mean, returns are a big problem these days, a big challenge for companies as customers have really demanding expectations for getting their money back and what they should be able to return and not paying for shipping and all of that. Just in your years, so many years of doing this, what is the right way to approach returns that you think is fair for a D2C brand and also fair for the customer? Yeah. Well, look, again, I think it's very important to have really sharp policies, you know, really um, thoughtful, customer centric, hopefully, but also um, business minded policies. And that way you can protect the business and and hopefully treat people fairly whether they want to agree that they like it or not or are treated fairly on the other hand you then have to decide how you're going to behave so policy is one thing now what's your norm what do you actually do you know i think a good example is nordstrom right like their famed sort of return mechanism that is i think we all know if we follow nordstrom as my wife was as certainly regaled me with you know like there are many people who who took so advantage of their very liberal point of view on returns that eventually things had to change and at least mechanisms had to be put in place, including taking your phone number and sort of tracking these returns to avoid just straight up um, almost criminal behavior, you know, around the return policy. So I, I didn't think know that. that. Number one, I didn't know people were doing that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because, you know, there, there are just a lot of ways to sort of take advantage of a system that's that loose. Like they'll return anything, they'll return anywhere. You know, that's, that was kind of their, now the good thing is they've kept, I think they've managed to do it. I think as I observe, and I'm not an expert on Nordstrom, but I think that they've, they, they seem to have maintained that perception of being, you know, a leader in that way, even though they've, I think, cracked down on trying to eliminate the worst offenders that were just purely using it for personal gain, finding ways to kind of game the system etc. And so my, my point is, I think, especially while you're up and coming, look, there was a point where Nordstrom was up and coming, you know, they were, they were up and coming against the other big box, you know, names and whatnot. And I think as you're up and coming, you have to, you have to behave one way. And as you become a target and whatnot, you have to begin behaving a different way to some degree. But the trick is, can you hang on to, can you do it elegantly, you know, without mm -hmm. just becoming a big jerk when you get like big and big and big and rich or something, so to speak. Um, yeah. So it's a moving target, you know, but I think if the desire is there and, and you haven't lost touch with your customer, you know, then, then it's all navigable, but it's, there isn't one, a one size fits all approach to that. 
And I think as you're coming up, you have to take risks on your customer. You have to, you have to sort of like lean toward the customer because you gotta, you gotta build that customer base, build that goodwill. Mm -hmm. Are you able to track your investments in customer experience like a friendly return policy along with some kind of ROI? And if so, how do you do it? Yeah. Um, I like that sigh. That's exactly how most yeah. people feel when I say CX and ROI. Ah. Well, that's the thing, right? Is that it's it's very tricky because there are some programs that are more trackable than others. Like for instance, like we can certainly track the cost of our returns and the you know the cost of of our policies as we enforce them or whatever, um, or don't enforce them. The problem is, is that's not the whole CX, right? The the customer experience is complex, <laughs> right? And and the reasons for purchasing are even more complex. You know, sometimes sometimes it's as simple as like, you had me at in stock, <laughs> you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. or you had me at like I could get it up my stairs. It's for reasons that have nothing to do with like what you think of as like your core value proposition. You had me as like it's it's the only thing that would I could could be carried up into my attic mm -hmm. things that you can't predict. Mm -hmm. Um, but then maybe they return it and, or maybe they, or maybe they return part of it or who knows what, and that affects obviously the ROI on that customer interaction. So it's, it's almost impossible at scale to break all that down. And so you can make estimates, um, you know, and you can obviously track the whole. And as you make changes to your policies or to the way you behave, you can obviously see kind of the direction that it's going, but these things are very hard, you know, even as sophisticated as we've gotten compared to where we were, when it's just a few of us kind of manning all stations, we've certainly, you know, are a lot more um, complex than that at Lovesack HQ today. But, but even, even still, you know, a lot of those things. And I think many companies that tell you that they can, um, I don't know that they actually can, like, you know, uh, so, but, but I don't know. That's been my experience. I, I will say that we do live and die by that um, CLV to CAC ratio, you know, what it costs us to acquire a customer as a whole, mm -hmm. including, you know, on a net basis, including returns, all that stuff, mm -hmm. product costs, what have you, um, versus that lifetime value. But, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's also a two-ended stick. Like you can also increase the lifetime value and that, and frankly, we lean toward that. Like we would rather be more liberal with, like we'd rather have a return policy that we can always lean on and stand behind, right? Sure, that's customer centric, but hopefully um, behave in as in as sort of like <coughs> loving way as possible. It's in our name, yeah, you know. Right. We hang it over our door. We try not to be a bunch of jerks inside. Um, but then if we want to make the business healthier, it's like, let's, let's focus on how we can drive that AOV up, that customer lifetime value up, the money they spend with us. Not because, you know, we're, we're going to take more money from them, but because we're going to deliver more value. They, where they want to spend more with us because, so Stealth Tech's a good example. We just invented this product called Stealth Tech. It's this whole immersive surround sound system that's inside your couch. You don't see it. It's beautiful because it's, it's not there. And, and it's perfect home audio it's amazing. But the coolest part is if you bought your sectional six years ago, you can still add it. Oh, my my okay. sectionals are 15 years old, some of them. And, and you can add stealth tech to it. And like, there's no other brand on the planet practically that operates that way. You know, almost every other thing that we own just makes us buy a new one every couple of years. Like, or sorry, you know, you got to get the new one to get like that feature. And right. so we're really proud, you know, and that's a payoff of our design. Flower. And so we would rather entice you to, you know, spend more with us than to sort of put your head in a vice because, uh, we, you know, we're not going to make any money if we, if we get an extra return or two. Yeah, um, that's great. And it's more, it's better for the planet too. It's more sustainable. So there's a lot of benefits to being able to innovate a product that already exists rather than create a new one. Um, are you ready to take some fun rapid fire questions so my audience can get to know you a little bit better? Do it. Let's go. All right. All right, Sean. What did you eat for breakfast today? Nothing. I don't eat breakfast. Every, every guest says that. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Oh, spending time with my family. What is one mental health strategy for managing hard days? 
Uh, physical activity. I will push myself to get on my surfboard, skateboard, bike, run, whatever. What is your favorite type of vacation? Uh, beach. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? <sighs> hmm. John Lennon. If you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what is it? Uh, get off the couch. Do it now. That is so great because you make couches. That is just, I feel like that's your, <laughs> that should be a tagline for your company. Sean, this has been so fun. If people want to learn more about LoveSack, where can they do so? Yeah, of course, lovesack.com. Um, I'm, you know, we're all easy to find on social media. I'm Sean of LoveSack on YouTube and Instagram and all the channels. And uh, would love to stay in touch with any of you. All right, Sean. Well, thank you so much, everybody. You've been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. If you have a moment, please rate, subscribe to the Modern Customer. And until next time, thanks for tuning in.